1949, a party of big game hunters, following the course of the river Narmada in central India, chanced upon a young man in a state of deep meditation. He was surrounded by crocodiles. Stunned by the sight, they took a photograph, which was published the next day. In a few weeks, the man was installed to one of the highest spiritual positions in India. This is the extraordinary story of a man who could control the uncontrollable, a man of many facets and many roles, but above all, a man of indomitable faith in the divine nature of humanity. The Himalayas are known for being the highest mountains on earth. For those living around them, this region is also known as Devbhumi, the abode of the gods. This for many is a crossing place between the sacred and the secular. For several millennia, men and women of different faiths seeking spiritual awareness have been drawn to the crystal silence of these mountains. It was here in 1925 that Swami Rama was born to a learned Brahmin family of Uttar Pradesh, a northern state of India. From the very beginning, his life was an unusual one. His birth had been foretold by Babaji, a great sage of Bengal. Babaji initiated him into spiritual practices at the age of three. Often at a young age, the boy was raised by the sage in the cave monasteries of the Himalayas. By the age of 18, Swami Rama was trained in various schools of Indian philosophy. Under the guidance of Babaji, he underwent rigorous yogic disciplines. While at university in Allahabad, he invariably amazed his professors by his power of concentration and his spiritual wisdom. He travelled extensively along the path of the Himalayas, teaching Hindu and Buddhist scriptures in various monasteries. At 21, he journeyed to Tibet to meet with his Grand Master and to further his knowledge of yogic practices. In spite of deep knowledge of the scriptures and great expertise of yogic techniques, his Master was aware that the young adept had yet to acquire dispassion and non-attachment. He instructed Swami Rama to travel the country and to undertake periods of intense meditation. It was at this stage that Swami Rama was sighted by hunters. The picture they took of him meditating amongst crocodiles came to the attention of Dr. Kurt Koti, the Shankaracharya of Karvipitham, who was looking for a successor. He sent scholars to observe this young, virtually unknown adept. Shortly thereafter, Swami Ram was installed to the position of Shankaracharya, one of the most regarded spiritual positions of the country. He was 24. Renamed Sadashiv Bharati, the young Shankaracharya lost little time in introducing significant social-religious reforms. He permitted the entry of untouchables into temples and abolished the age-old custom of Devdasis women who were often forced to live in temples to serve priests in the name of God. But Sadashiv Bharati was not content. His position required him to lead a ritualistic and ostentatious life. For a free spirit, a man of truth, and a man of silence, it was increasingly stifling. 
With little time to meditate, he was teaching others what he himself could not practice. Three years later, leaving the pomp and grandeur behind, he simply walked away. Back with his master in the Himalayas, Swami Rama spent many years intensifying his meditation. As he would recall later in his life, these mountains are so calm and serene that one is led to a spontaneous state of silence. Those residing in these mountains naturally become meditators. Following the instructions of his master, for 11 months he lived in complete isolation in a cave with a tiny opening. His food was left outside. He cleansed his body through vigorous yogic techniques of pranayam. Eleven months later, he emerged, a man with a purpose, with determination to serve humanity and to build a bridge between science and spirituality. Swami Rama began his task by studying Western philosophy and psychology at universities in Bangalore, Prayag and Varanasi. He completed a degree of Doctor of Homeopathic Medicine and Surgery at Darbhanga. He then travelled to Europe, where he continued his studies at several universities, including Oxford. He worked for a while as a medical consultant in London and assisted in parapsychological research in Moscow. He returned to India in 1966 and established a clinic and an ashram at Rishikesh on the banks of the Ganges. Two years later, he journeyed to Japan. He met with the spiritual head of Sukhyo Mahikari, Reverend Okadasan. Much to his surprise, when Swami Ram was introduced to him, Okadasan instantly embraced him and said, I have been waiting for you. I hope you will help me learn the secret teachings of the Himalayan masters. Swami Rama stayed in Japan for six months and taught various spiritual groups in Tokyo and Osaka. From Japan, he embarked upon another long journey, this time to the United States of America. Upon his arrival, he was invited by Dr. Elmer Green to the Manager Foundation at Topeka, Kansas. Dr. Green was working on a project investigating the voluntary control of involuntary states. Swami Rama was to be the subject. The general scientific consensus at that time was that the human mind was capable of controlling only those bodily functions that lay in the realm of consciousness. Swami Rama was to prove them wrong. Experiments revealed astonishing results. Swami Rama demonstrated extraordinary control over his brain, heart, circulatory and nervous systems. He commanded his brain to produce theta and delta waves on demand. Delta waves are associated with deep sleep. Yet, he accurately recalled all that transpired in the room during that period. He produced different temperatures on adjacent areas of the palm of his hand, a 10 degree difference by dilating one artery and constricting the other. He raised his heartbeat to 300 beats a minute, creating a condition known as atrial flutter, which stops the heart from pumping blood. He held it for 17 seconds, time enough to kill a man. In another demonstration, using mental power alone, he caused a 14-inch knitting needle mounted on a shaft five feet away to spin. Swami Rama was the first yogi to subject himself to modern scientific investigations. His demonstrations undoubtedly took the scientific community and others by storm. You're saying then that all of us have the capacity yes. to control what we have heretofore thought of as the involuntary features of our body. Right. But there are two sets of muscles. One is called voluntary and another is involuntary system. Yeah. 
So far, people think that involuntary system is not under our conscious control, but that's not true. Our involuntary system can be controlled, you're saying? Very easily. Including our breathing? Yeah. Can I control my breathing without thinking about it? No. The experiments he participated in helped revolutionize scientific thinking regarding the relationship between body and mind, previously thought to be limited to voluntary processes. Reports of these demonstrations were documented in numerous leading scientific journals of the time. Owing to mounting interest, Swami Rama embarked upon a series of lectures. He explained that his work was based on a simple fact. Body, mind, soul and breath are interconnected. Yoga is a spiritual science that helps awaken one to the deeper dimensions of being. One thus achieves complete control over physical, biochemical, biological and psychological functions. He explained that power over the autonomic nervous system lies in the proper method of breathing. The first step was to observe one's breath. His simple explanations to complex phenomena combined with his humility won him many admirers. People from different walks of life regarded him as their teacher. In 1971, he founded the Himalayan International Institute of Yoga Science and Philosophy of the USA. Having spent almost 40 years close to nature, Swami Rama encouraged his students to do the same. The gardens surrounding the institute were a manifestation of respect for nature. Far from the chaotic and stressful pace of life, it provided students with a peaceful, healthy environment to discover their potential. Using his knowledge of ancient Indian practices, Swami Rama designed practical courses to counter the ills of modern day living. Fear, anxiety, depression, loneliness and mental trauma. He started with basic lectures and programs on breathing exercises, Hatha Yoga, diet and meditation. Residential programs were started for those who felt the need to stay and work on their habits and lifestyle. Swami Rama trained a faculty of psychologists, physicians and philosophers to conduct seminars and courses to address these problems. His scientific as well as practical approach to spirituality appealed to many. But perhaps it was his undying love for every living being and his spiritual wisdom that captivated those who met him. Soon, the community grew as entire families settled down at the institute. Swami Rama explained, for those seeking awareness, there is no superior or inferior path. It is immaterial which path one follows. They all lead to the same destination. But one must watch one's mind. The first step was to learn how to meditate. Meditation is beyond thinking. You do not meditate on your problems in order to solve them. But with meditation, you see through the problems you have set up for yourself. One cannot expect long-lasting joy from short-lived objects of the exterior world, for that joy will never be permanent. His was a call to look within. The Institute published numerous books explaining the 5,000-year-old tradition of the Himalayan sages, values that cut across barriers of religion, caste or creed. These were subsequently translated into various languages as affiliated centers spread in cities across the United States, Canada, England, Germany, Italy, Spain and Southeast Asia. Swami Rama stressed the importance of physical fitness. An unhealthy body, he explained, dissipates the mind. Maintaining physical health is thus an integral part of spiritual practice. Yet, he cautioned against excesses. Remember, you have a body, he said, but you are not just a body. An avid tennis player, he was also a master of Kung Fu. Under his guidance, Biofeedback was used as a therapeutic modality 
and the foundations of stress management and holistic health programs were established. Those living close to him were astonished at the various facets of his personality. A sensitive poet, an accomplished singer, musician and painter, the predominant essence in his work was unconditional love and humility, as portrayed in his painting of the Buddha. To cultivate the quality of humility, he said, is one step towards enlightenment. All arts and sciences are expressions of the creative force of the divine. Creativity flows when the mind is peaceful and joyful. For that, one must renounce fear, anxiety and the ego and live each moment with awareness. There are no limits on human accomplishment, provided one has faith in self-effort and in the grace of divine and cosmic consciousness. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwara, Guru Sakshat Parabrahma. Swami Rama had come to the United States with a mission to build a bridge between science and spirituality. His master had explained to him that the objective of both was the same, to find the source of peace and happiness. Science seeks it in the external world, spirituality in the inner world. Swami Ram had accomplished his mission, but his work was not over yet. In 1985, he journeyed to India, to his beloved Himalayas. For two years, he searched for an appropriate location in Uttar Pradesh to set up what he had in mind. He finally found it between Rishikesh and Dehradun, a piece of land at Jolly Grant. He had noticed that only the most basic medical care was available in this remote region. Here at Jolly Grant, he established the Himalayan Institute Hospital Trust. Dr. Rama, you are also building this very modern hospital near Dehradun. Yes. Tell us about it. That's my dream being materialized. You see, and I think the dream is fulfilled when it comes into action. And uh, I had a great fire within me to build this great hospital which will serve people, particularly poor people, and, uh, you know, the people of the mountain of Kumaung and Garhwal region are very poor. They cannot afford to go to the hospitals because hospitals are far away. People die before they reach the hospital. So I want to give them all these facilities and modern amenities so that they don't have to rush to Bombay, Delhi, Chandigarh, and all the problems can be solved at the head of it began as a small outpatient facility serving people from nearby villages and towns. Within three months, the size of both the staff and the facilities expanded fourfold. In five years, the hospital was complete. Inaugurated in 1994 by Dr. Manmohan Singh, India's finance minister of the time, the Himalayan Institute Hospital is an ultra-modern medical center designed to serve the medical needs of 10 million people of the Garhwal and Kumaung Himalayas. But Swami Rama's vision was not confined to a hospital. Besides a nursing school, a medical college was established in 1995. It is a unique model of education in the country, combining medical education 
with an understanding of integrated holistic health. Recognized by the Medical Council of India, it is the first private medical college in the state of Uttar Pradesh. But healthcare was only a partial answer to the problems of the region. A rural development project was started to improve living standards in villages. With a dedicated staff of a handful, the RDI provides outreach programs for 600 villages through mobile clinics and satellite centers. The RDI offers education in sanitation, immunization, maternal and childcare health, nutrition, family planning, and prevention and control of endemic diseases. Swami Rama personally supervised every single detail at Jolly Grant. He was indefatigable. Perhaps it was his yogic training and practice. Perhaps it was his unconditional love. Or perhaps it was his determination to serve humanity that gave him the energy he displayed. Deho Devalaya Prokta Jivo Dev Sanatana. My philosophy is this human body is the highest of all shrines and the inner dweller Atma is the Deva and a human being is the highest of all beings. My God is in you. If I don't adore God in you and then go to, the, to a temple, that's all hypocrisy. Swami Rama received many accolades, including the Martin Buber Award and the Shiromani Award from the Vice President of India. But these meant little to him. It was not in him to take credit for what he did. I am a messenger, he said. A messenger delivering the wisdom of the Himalayan sages of my tradition. My job is to introduce you to the teacher within. Life is a beautiful song. Sing it and you will find the composer seated in the lotus of your heart. Swami Rama left his body on 13th November 1996. His had been an extraordinarily fascinating journey, rather unbelievable for those who did not know him. For those who did, he will live forever in the lotus of their hearts. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwara, Guru Saksha, Parabrahma. Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Tasmai Shri Gurave 